Uh, my purpose today is to inspire and to give you a, a pep talk, uh, having having an opportunity on my my end to actually brush with power for a few for a total of two hours. I thought I'd share that experience for you because that's probably as close as anyone will ever get to the G8 or the G20. These new animals that have dominated the global economy and are setting the rules for the future um, without of course all of the other nations represented. What am I talking about? Well there are over 195 nations and the G8 of course is meeting without the majority and the G20 uh, uh, brings to the table other nations that have some of the world's largest economies like China, Nigeria, in Indonesia, South Africa, Brazil, Argentina, and they're not represented this weekend here either. Okay, so it's a, except for Angela Merkel, it's been a boys club. <coughs> and it's an elite boys club that plays outside the rules, outside the UN international uh, system of law. And in the process, reshape the global order in our own image. And you, as you've heard today, it's not a very pretty image when it comes to global wealth inequality, when it comes to environmental degradation, and uh, putting the planet in peril. So the question is, where do we get power to shift and reshape and transform the global economy? So one of the strategies that we've, uh, I've been involved with is to bring together leading voices from civil society. Those are NGOs, civil society groups from around the world, not just here in the United States, because they're, let's be honest, they're part of uh, a well-defined articulate group, but we want to bring voices from China, Indonesia, and other places to also have a foothold at the global level. And so in, uh, in the process of looking for global voices, um, in June of 2010, we had the first civil society dialogue with the G20. Uh, the G20 is probably a more legitimate actor because at least it includes not the Western powers, but actually opens up the, the, the opportunity for voices from the developing world to be present. And so we brought leaders, 20 leaders from around the world, from civil society, to share their perspective on what was happening in their own countries and how the G20 needs to be cognizant and transform the agenda towards a more people-centered development strategy. Not one that's based on corporations, not one that's based on, uh, on top-down uh, decision-making and trade agreements, but one that's based on empowering smallholders, the social economy, cooperatives, and a whole range of important strategies that lead to sustainable economic prosperity. The meeting was very interesting. We get to meet with the Sherpa. Who is the Sherpa? It's the person who carries all of the proposals so that when the Prime Minister or the President flies in, they know what the policies and the discussions and the negotiations are. So we got to meet with the Sherpa in Canada and his sous Sherpa, the Finance Minister, and talk about what the priorities are. But my colleagues uh, in Canada were very um, clever. One of, the, one of the representatives that they brought was from a First Nation, an Indian tribe in Northwest Canada, to open the meeting. And he brought his medicine man. And the normally, you know, uh, finance ministers really don't listen to First Nation tribal leaders. But the opening was the following. Uh, the leader said, let us hope that today's deliberations will be thought of in terms of what's going to happen seven generations from now. Let's make sure we make decisions today that ensures a healthy, whole planet for those who come seven generations from now. He was Iroquois. And so in the process, all of a sudden, the finance minister's going, oh, I have to think about, I'm just trying to figure out how to save the economy today. Long term, seven generations, I don't know. So it put him on edge. And it was a fascinating debate because where we were headed was to ask, well, we're not sure you actually rescued the global economy. 
And as you've heard today, the global economy is only one of several crises, from the food crisis, the energy crisis, the water crisis, the climate crisis. And so solving the economic crisis is only one piece of the puzzle, and that's the only one they care about, because that's why these other things, these byproducts exist. So where are we today? What's, what are the chances for turning this around? Well, as you've heard, the Jubilee Movement was very effective in getting debt relief because citizens protested. The IMF, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, did not want to pursue debt relief. No banker says, hey, I'm going to forgive the debt. I don't really need that money. No, there was no interest in doing so. But how did this decision actually happen? Uh, citizens use their rights as voters, but as activists, they took to the streets. They voted with their feet. They surrounded the building when the G8 was meeting in Birmingham in the UK in 1998. They circled the building, 16 miles long, citizens, and they said, you can't leave until you agree to address the debt crisis. All right? Wow. Wasn't violent. It was nonviolent protest that circled the building, and the leaders one of them being Bill Clinton's was smart enough to say, you know, we ought to do something. <laughs> so he wanted to go home, but he also wanted to leave with his head held high. So he said, let's address the debt crisis. And that's where we got the an initial effort to address debt relief, and of course, these half-baked efforts by the IMF and the World Bank to address the HIPAA in initiative that has not uh, liberated all of these countries that are still caught in this debt cycle, but has moved forward, as you've heard today. So where, what are we talking about? Citizens being empowered, citizens expressing their voice. And there are many ways to do that. So how does this all come home to us here in Maryland? Well, the first piece is that I have to tell you that the finance minister in Canada wanted us to pat him on the back. We just saved the global economy, he said. And we said, oh my God, you built it out of straw, didn't you? And we said, you had some other materials you could have used, uh, piggy. And in the process, what we were really saying to him is, it's not about the quantity of economic growth. It's not about the quantity. We can generate, as, as Brent, Brent Blackwelder and others have noticed, we can generate more and more and bigger profits but the, it's not the quantity that matters, it's the quality of that growth. So if we're, if we're taking tar sands from Canada, which is part of the G8's negotiations, if we take, take tar sands and allow that to be transferred to the United States on a pipeline, that dirties the environment um, and has long-term effects for the climate. As James Hansen, the leading climate scientist, says, it's game over for our climate catastrophe. If that's what we want, sure, that will generate growth, but at the expense of the planet. So we really have to understand what is the quality of that growth? What does it do to rebuild communities? What does it do to ensure health, environment, and long-term prosperity? Sorry, tar sands does not do it. So we need to look at all of those things that affect our communities. Um, and how that plays out. So, but that's not enough. And as you heard in the first session today, we also need to understand the equality of that growth. Who's be being benefited? Well, as we showed up in, in Toronto, everyone was quite upset about the banks being bailed out, the 1%. But what about the rest? Who's really benefited from the global bailout and the stimulus funds? And so very, very big concerns about that. And then the last piece was the sustainability of that growth. That as many nations engaged in setting up stimulus funds to re-engage their economies, they should have been also re-engaging with sustainable forms of economic prosperity. So in the case of China, 85% of their funds were in green business activities. Only 18% in the United States. South Korea, 58% of their funds were invested in green businesses. 
in order to make this transition to a more productive, environmentally sound, and economically prosperous economy. So that's the challenge, and that's the debate that's happening. And we have the opportunity to do that as individuals and working collectively. So the last piece, and I, I thank you again for raising the vote about the question about voting, but we have to think of ourselves as voting more than just once every four years. We have to think of ourselves in terms of voting as consumers. So are we going to buy organic? Are we going to buy local? Or are we going to get on the internet and extract something from Amazon? Are we going to do as informed consumers what we need to do in voting with our dollars? Are we going to boycott certain firms that engage in uh, environmentally unsound practices um, that, that privatize our water? Are we going to boycott, support those companies that are doing good and are reinvesting back into our communities? Um, the next piece is we are all investors. We have pension funds. We, are, we have money that we can reinvest back into our communities. And that's a vote for hope. That's a vote for prosperity. 